in response to the virus, uh, causes a uh, post-inflammatory syndrome and, and can be quite significant. And maybe our colleague wants to comment about it. Um, but I think that's important, um, that, that, that really the individuals under the age of, um, you know, clearly 45 that don't have a significant comorbidity, that this virus has very limited pathogenicity. Um, I would be remiss since I may not get another question just to ask the one thing that I do think it's important for me to be the advocate for for all of you is that this is the year to really promote influenza vaccination. And I think people know that I'm quite concerned about the fall and winter when we have these two uh, respiratory pathogens emerging. And it can be very complicated, obviously, in the school setting if we all of a sudden have an epidemic of a respiratory illness. The, the only difference is flu is likely to be symptomatic in the children, all right? And of course, the COVID is likely to be asymptomatic. But this is the real year to try to really embrace vaccination with confidence, particularly for flu vaccine. Dr. Goza, do you want to comment any further? No, I think Dr. Redfield covered the post-inflammatory syndrome very well. It's still very rare, lots of more information to be learned about it as we go forward, but um, there are people looking at it very closely at the academy and trying to figure out what we need to do. Okay, great. And no worries, Dr. Redfield, I do have more questions for you. Um, Dr. Piercy, um, Tennessee has many rural communities and we know there are a lot of challenges to virtual learning. They may not have uh, broadband access, um, but there are also transportation challenges for children going back to school. Um, how's Tennessee addressing the issue of transportation in the reopening process? Yes, ma'am, you bring up a good point that uh, we have a very wide geography in Tennessee with a lot of diversity. We have rural counties that believe it or not, are still in the single digits of case counts. We have metro areas that are exceeding 12,000. And so in Tennessee, we've learned that one size doesn't fit all. There are specific needs in our rural communities, like transportation, like technology. And so that's why it's been important for us to be able to work on the local level to individualize the response. Transportation is one of those things that uh, a lot of our rural children rely upon. And so we, we have to be able to do that in a safe manner. Things like skipping seats or cohorting uh, kids in seats that are in the same household. And we are also working with very uh, practical tips for bus drivers. It's not practical for a bus driver to screen kids as they come onto the bus. And so whether that's an at-home attestation prior to getting on the bus, or whether that's screening immediately after departing the bus, those types of practical tips are ways that we're addressing transportation, for example. And that's something that our districts are looking for. They're looking for that very specific blocking and tackling day-to-day uh, -day, uh, guidance that they need to be able to offer safe, uh, a safe environment for their children. And so uh, we've, in Tennessee, we've uh, created toolkits and toolkits from transportation to uh, how do you do meals? How do you do um, choir and band, things that have been mentioned before? And then something that's very popular everywhere, but particularly in the South, how are we gonna do football in the fall? And uh, so these are the kind of things that we're uh, looking at and working with our stakeholders every day. Great, thanks very much. Um, I have a couple of questions that I want to just pose to everybody and give everybody a chance to, to answer. Um, the first was, I'm wondering if you can, you, you all go out and you travel a lot, you talk to a lot of people, I'm wondering if you can describe an issue or a concern that someone brought to you in the process of considering school reopening that, that surprised you or, or concerned you because maybe it wasn't factually based. And I'm just wondering how you, um, how you dealt with that. Dr. Pierce. I, I can go first. Okay. Um, you know, something that we have seen and we've put it sort of on our best practices list is there is a very rare instance when an entire district has to be closed. And uh, I know that was the approach at the beginning, and it's been referenced earlier, these wide sweeping uh, restrictions. But as we're going back to school, we really need to talk about an individualized and very specific approach. It may be that 
in the inevitable case that uh, these infections come into schools, that you close a classroom or you close a wing or a corridor and perhaps the entire building. But that's something that we heard that um, it's an all or none on a district opening or closing, uh, which is really not based in science and is certainly not uh, the best way to educate all of the children across an entire district. That's a great point, thanks very much. So I'll have to disagree, I haven't been traveling much since March. <laughs> I've been in my office and in my home and I have a little corner of my office that is now called my studio for when I get interview requests. But um, so I think one of the biggest questions I get from parents is, but what if they come home and we wanna go visit the grandparents and you know they've been exposed then and how do we keep our grandparents and, and our you know family that may have health issues safe? And so I think that's a big question that's on the minds of a lot of parents and just reassuring them you know that that the schools will be safe and that we will have that information that is, if we do see COVID in the schools that the parents will know about it because I think they sometimes think that the schools keep it secret so they don't want to let them know that they've been exposed. Um, I don't think that ever happens but that's kind of their thought process and so reassuring parents that the school systems the public health and the pediatricians will all be working together to keep their children safe is very important. Yeah, I, I have two maybe quick things. One is I think the one of the biggest challenges we're having right now is how to really communicate the message of the importance of social distancing, mask and hand hygiene to the millennials and Generation uh, X uh, individuals. I just I don't think we've been very successful in that. And you know we've talked about it. I know when I call my children on the phone, uh, I never get a response, but when I text them, I, they come, get back to me within about five minutes or less. I do think we need a strategy. I don't think we've hit home there. I don't think the younger group understands how important it is for them to fully participate uh, in the social distancing. The other is that we talked about, you know, that this isn't a, uh, all or none. There's a lot of space in between, and I think we have to be more open to embracing those gray zones. And I think the one as a physician that's probably uh, saddened me the most, and I've been involved in this, uh, is individuals that are in end of life and they've really been denied any access to their family members. There clearly is a safe way that those family members could have had access. When I see people dying talking to their uh, parents on the phone, it really kind of bothers me. So I do think those are the two things that I think we as physicians and healthcare professionals, it's not black or white. There is a gray there, you know, and we can find a safe way for that gray to take place. Thanks very much. Those are very important points. I want to ask each of you to um, just comment about what we should be doing in an ongoing fashion. So we've talked a lot about the process of reopening schools and the importance of that. But what should we be doing to continually reassure parents, families, um, those that work in our schools, that the school is safe, uh, even, even if there's a rise in cases in the community? I think one of the lessons that we've learned, not only as it pertains to schools, but in the entire response, is to avoid extremes. And when everything is one way or the other, that doesn't lend itself to learning and to applying new learning about what, uh, what we're finding out about this disease process. And what happens when one takes one extreme or the other is that when you get new information, you suddenly perpetuate mistrust. And we want parents to trust us, and we want parents to be able to rest safely or, or, or rest uh, assured in that their children are going to be taken care of safely. And so I think transparency is a really important part of that. Transparency even about the uncertainty. I'm not sure anybody's got this completely figured out yet. And no school district has this completely figured out yet. And I guarantee there will be something that happens that's unexpected. And so communicating that transparency to parents and setting that realistic expectations of this is our plan right now, but we're in constant communication with our health officials, with our local leaders. We're looking at the data on a regular, almost daily basis and making those decisions 
sometimes on the fly. That's okay, because we want to be able to customize that approach to what's best for that school at that time. And so really communicating uh, transparently uh, and ensuring that everybody remains flexible in the process is really important. I think that goes back to our saying that we have to be able to switch gears very quickly and be very nimble and flexible. And we are learning about this disease. If we went back to what we said early in March, we probably, it's totally different than what we know now, um, or not totally different, but a lot different. And we call it, we've started doing guidelines instead of policies at the academy related to COVID-19 because we do know that we need to review them very frequently because they are updated very often with the new data that we have. And so in letting parents know that we are watching that data, we are watching what's going on, we are going to be able to change as the information that we receive changes and the data changes. Yeah, I think it's important when I uh, made my opening comments, um, I made the point is that we need to plan to open these schools uh, with the understanding that COVID-19 is going to occur. I really think it's important to get ahead of the curve for schools and parents and teachers to kind of understand ahead of time uh, how that school is going to respond when in fact they do get case, a case or a cluster of cases, you know, as opposed to necessarily getting the storyboards going and overreacting and, and really starting going down the, a path. As you know, I mentioned that CDC did not recommend the schools be closed, but obviously the civil leaders made that decision. I'm not critical of it. I'm just saying from a public health point of view, we didn't see that schools needed to be closed generally. There may have been in certain schools that we saw should be closed because of outbreaks, uh, just like we do for influenza. When it occurs, we shut down spor sporadically a school here and there to try to close the epidemic or measles. Um, but I do think getting ahead of the curve that you're talking about, how you're going to handle cases of COVID in the school when you diagnose them so that doesn't become some type of you know, nine o'clock at night phone call tree that goes through the community. And the next thing you know, you have the school shut down for, you know, a week rather than everyone being on board how we're going to handle this. I think that's really important. Thanks very much. Um, we have time for one last question. And um, that question is for each of you, what would be the one key take home message that you want people who hear this to get today? So in addition to being a state health official, my more important role is I'm a mother of four. I have one that's about to start college and then three in high school. And you know, what I want to know is that my children are going to be safe. And I also want to know that I can trust those making the decisions that they're going to take all of this into consideration when they're making these incredibly impactful decisions. It was mentioned earlier but even those of us who have resources and have good coping skills, our children have struggled through this. And they don't fortunately have to worry about some of the other very serious social issues that some students do. So recognizing that this impacts all students, taking this approach to getting our kids safely back into school is probably one of the single most important things we can do to reopen our state, reopen our economy, and get on with our lives. So just like our guidance says, we do believe that the goal should be for every state to, to have the goal of in-person school, but with those schools opening safely. And I would just echo the, you know, the most important thing from my point of view, from a public health point of view, from a risk versus risk point of view, that uh, we need to reopen our schools. And we, we need to uh, plan to keep our schools reopened. I think this really is the important message, and this is why we're having these discussions, to get people to understand that um, we need to reopen the schools, we can do this safely, we need to commit to it, and we need just to get it done. Well, I'd like to, to thank um, all of our panelists um, for a really interesting and important discussion. And, uh, and I hope that this will help our communities to think through the reopening of their schools and what that's going to entail. Uh, thanks very much.
effectively implementing safe school reopening. And I uh, have the pleasure of introducing the moderator for the panel, who's actually going to introduce all of the panelists. So Frank Brogan is the Assistant Secretary for Elementary and Secondary Education, a longtime educator himself. Uh, he is keenly interested in hearing from, and uh, we are all interested in learning from those who are well down this path, how you're thinking about this and how each uh, state and locale is looking at the different factors for your particular communities. So with that, I'll turn it over to Frank Brogan to introduce the panel. Thank you, Secretary, um, and thank you all for being with us. I can't tell you as this was being put together uh, how flattered we all were at the incredible uh, number of and quality of the people who agreed to participate in this. And I think that credibility is going to help the message coming out of these meetings uh, go farther faster uh, because you are a part of it. So thank you for that. Uh, I'm going to introduce our panelists one at a time and then ask them to come forward. We like a flourish uh, on this panel and we thought we'd start that way. Uh, in no order of import because they are all equally important. Yes, I was a fifth grade teacher at one point. I would like to introduce Dr. Sue Elsperman, who is the president of Ivy Tech Community College in Indiana. I was sharing uh, with her uh, that we uh, share a lineage. Uh, I was born in Indiana, but I also was uh, the lieutenant governor of the state of Florida, she having been uh, the lieutenant governor of Indiana. So we've got a lot going on here. Um, and uh, she uh, is a longtime educator, higher education, and we thought on this panel it was important to have all bases covered, uh, not just K through 12, but higher education as well. So, uh, Doctor, thank you very much for joining us. We're delighted to have you today. Uh, also, a friend of mine and a colleague, uh, Margie Vandevin, who is the Commissioner of Education for the M Missouri Department of Education. Margie, welcome. Uh, having been uh, Florida's Commissioner of Education, uh, I know what she does, and it's a heavy lift in every state, uh, but we're delighted to have her with us. She has more than 27 years of student-centered service in education, including three at Missouri's top educational post. She's a teacher who has provided education leadership in the classroom, and uh, we are indeed delighted to have her and her unique perspective as a chief state school officer on the panel with us. Next up, Nancy Eichholz, who is the school board president for Indian Hill School District in uh, Ohio. Uh, her professional background, Ms. Eichholz uh, currently works as the president and CEO of Aviatra uh, Accelerators Incorporated in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, she has a great education background, 1984 uh, attended, and I will say it because I grew up in Cincinnati, the Ohio State University in, uh, in the state of Ohio, a bachelor's degree in business admin. She also uh, attended the Kellogg School of Business for an MBA and executive program. And we're delighted to have her. And again, another unique perspective as one of those responsible for implementing all of the things we're talking about in terms of going back to school this year. Next up, uh, a fellow Irishman uh, and therefore believe about 50% of what he says. Uh, he also is a school principal, as was I at one point in my career, uh, and is uh, currently the principal at St. Vincent de Paul High School in California. This is a high school, uh, take it from me, that has an incredible reputation, and we were delighted to have him come all the way uh, from California to join us. He's got more than 20 years of successful in, uh, experience as a teacher, a coach, an administrator. Uh, he knows the high school I went to in uh, in Cincinnati, and I know the high school he is now attending to uh, in California. We're delighted to have Patrick Daly with us today. Welcome, Patrick. And uh, last, but as they say, certainly not least, uh, we needed a school superintendent. We found one, and a darn good one. Uh, we have Dr. Jeff Bearden, 
Uh, he joined the Forsyth County Schools as superintendent on September the 7th, 2014, and has served as a school executive for over 25 years. He knows not only the education layout, he knows the business and administration side of all things education. That will be invaluable to this country as we do go about the business of reopening America's schools. He has served as an assistant uh, superintendent, assistant principal. Uh, he's been an athletic director um, and really uh, has a tremendous reputation out there in the world of education. Would you first help uh, and join me in thanking our panelists for being with us today? And I'm going to make two very brief observations, but then we're going right to the panelists because uh, we will run out of time. We have a larger than uh, typical panel, uh, so I want to give everybody a good opportunity to share what they are doing, not thinking about doing, what they are doing to prepare to open America's schools in the fall. Uh, two simple observations. First of all, uh, the timing of everything that we are doing. I go all the way back to my childhood and remember that when I waved goodbye to everybody in my school, I knew it was going to be an incredibly long time before I saw my friends in many cases, certainly my teachers, uh, but it always seemed to amaze me uh, and over and over it occurred in the summertime how fast it would be until I laid eyes on the first back-to-school commercial on television. First of all, thought how unfair that was to do to me, uh, a practicing layabout every summer, to quickly tell me, get ready to go back to school, you'll need new shoes, but also it's helped me over the years recognize how fast that summer goes. And not just for students. As a fifth grade teacher, it was equally fast for me in that capacity as well. I make that case because while we keep talking about reopening America's schools as some futuristic proposition, start putting an X on the calendar on every day that goes by. It will be here before we know it. The second observation I have learned while uh, serving uh, with and for Secretary DeVos I am the Assistant Secretary for Elementary and Secondary Education, and a lot of things fall under my purview, as you might imagine, in that big Department of Education. One of them is to serve schools in America that have been victimized by natural disaster. If you stop and consider the number of these events that take place on an annualized basis across America and even out into the Pacific and the Atlantic because we serve everything from the Northern Mariana Islands in the Pacific to the Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico in the Atlantic. And by virtue of that fact, everything in between. And what you see sometimes almost quietly are major natural disasters that unfold that hit schools and school districts across the country. And Congress has, since Hurricane Katrina, been providing funds for these named events so that schools can, and this is the title of the program, restart. Why? Because Congress and the country have recognized more and more how vital operating America's schools are, not just for the obvious, the education of the children in them, but because they are the community in so many ways. And take one of those schools offline and consider the repertoire. You're talking in, in this office and what we do with a disaster recovery unit uh, that works on this every day, all day. It's everything from typhoons to volcanic eruption to floods, to hurricanes, to tornadoes, to wildfires, and I can go on and on. You can see these things in the headlines of some of your papers out there, I trust. But it is all focused and centered on getting these schools back up and operational, even in cases where schools have been wiped off of the face of the earth physically getting those children reorganized and back to business as rapidly as possible. And that continues now with something we thought we'd never see, which is a global pandemic, and all of America's schools being taken in some way, shape, or form offline. Uh, 
And so this conversation is so important because it's with people who are the practitioners. These are the people and the people they represent who are responsible for getting our schools up and operational, creating, again, safe environments where teachers can teach and children and students can learn at all age group levels and be able to come back to a normal environment as rapidly as possible. But last comment, knowing there are no guarantees here. We guarantee that we want to open all of America's schools. We know, however, with this unprecedented and this uh, complicated virus that we're all fighting out there, how we do that is probably going to be different place to place, situation from situation. And that's the enormous challenge that our practitioners face out there every day. The high water mark, of course, will be opening all of America's schools. And while that sounds simple, that in itself is a major complication. But knowing that with each passing day and this unprecedented envir environment that we're in, we may have to look at each school a bit differently, even in school districts, much less in states and across the country. That's the challenge that our implementers face. So I'm going to begin with one question, same all the way down the row. A bit of a different question coming back this way and then want to hear from each of you individually as to what you are doing and the steps that you are taking. But the tee-up question I want to provide for you, starting in this direction, is what is one major concern with the possibility of school reopening in the fall? Again, what is one major concern, that's all you're allowed, regarding the possibility of schools reopening in the fall? There are probably lots more than one. So representing community colleges is, will the students come? We're still running, and most are running about 20% behind on enrollments. Many parents have said, well, maybe, or the students have said, maybe I'll take a gap year. That's about the worst idea I've ever heard. But also, our students in community college are low income. They are the most vulnerable. They have lost their job. They are trying to decide how they're going to make ends meet and can they afford to come back. So that's the one concern of many that I have. You're not the only one that has that concern in higher ed, I trust. <laughs> that's a fact. Uh, Commissioner? How about you? Uh, boy, many, many concerns still, but uh, really eager to get back in that classroom. And I will say probably on a practical level, the one area that we keep coming back to is transportation. So your, your question of how will they get, the, uh, will they come back? Ours is how do we make sure kids can arrive at our door safely and be returned home safely? Because the safety of our children, we always say is, is when we pick them up in the morning and we return them in the afternoon. So um, thanks. Outstanding. Madam President. So uh, for us, one of many concerns, um, <clears throat> we are very motivated to get our children back in school. Our teachers are motivated, our board is motivated, everyone, parents are definitely motivated. However, the concern is getting everyone back and then having an issue or, or an outbreak and having to close back down or to quarantine certain uh, classes, uh, the disruption of that, that we get into a flow that I think part of the um, value of education and one of the assets is that consistency we get everybody back they're in a, they're, they're in a routine they're finally comfortable and then all of a sudden we have to send them back home again and that i think is one of the biggest things on our minds and we're really working to plan accordingly uh, but of course we have no idea what the unknowns could be thank you nancy to our principal i think i agree with the three ladies those are concerns that we have also the concerns that we have are you know we're a private catholic school so tuition revenue is our revenue source we do not receive state or federal funding so parents confidence in the plan that we're putting in place making sure that their children will be safe on our campus uh, making sure those those tuition dollars are well invested uh, and an increase in expenses of all the procedures and policies we're having to put in place in order to make sure it's a safe place. 
Well said. And to our superintendent, and the buck usually stops right there. Well, for us, it's, it's having to return to full-time virtual would be our biggest, biggest concern. I'm really proud of how well our teachers pivoted to that environment last spring. I think they did a masterful job. Um, the vast majority of our students remain engaged in the virtual environment, but I think we can all agree as we sit here today, uh, our children need to be back in school and we want them back in school. We plan on opening on August 6th. I know that's a lot earlier than many school systems around our country. We think it's uh, just incredibly important to get our, back, our kids back into school early. In the case we do have to pivot back to virtual, at least we will have established those relationships early on, which are critical to learning. Jeff, thank you. Well said. And I'm going to stick with you uh, as, as build, and we're going to come back this way. I'm going to take the question I just asked and turn it on its head and ask each of you, what is one major concern with the possibility of schools not reopening in the fall? Well, I think we've heard, you know, from our panelists today, you know, our kids need the, the, the social experience of school. Um, of course, academics is important, you know, rigor is important, but the social and emotional well-being of our students is critically important, and we cannot deliver the services they need if they're at home. So we desperately want them to come back so we can serve them well. Well said. Uh, the concern that we have is, is our county, Sonoma County, making a decision that uh, they're going to continue to shelter or have shelter in place. Uh, we have uh, students that range from Marin County, which is south of us, and Sonoma County as well. And the fear is, is continuing distance learning. I, I just don't think it's beneficial for brains that are 14 to 18 years old. And I think it's really important for a variety of reasons why we should return to school. And we plan to return August 10th, and that has been the plan since uh, March 17th when we, <laughs> we closed our school. So our plan was immediately to return and put all the policy and procedures in place yeah, to ensure as, that. As a lot of you in this audience know, there's a phenomenon that plays out uh, every year uh, when students go away for the summer and come back in the fall, it is renowned as the summer slide, which means how much regression did a student uh, deal with from the time they left and what they knew to the time they came back and what they forgot in between. Uh, summertime for many, many children, not exactly an Olympic event in the world of academia. So by virtue of that fact, can you imagine six months in, in some places of what was a two and a half month summer slide that is now a six month period of time and what the returning students are gonna be dealing with when they come back. So, well said. So I think if we are unable to return to school, it is just catastrophic. I, I can't even imagine um, the fallout. And I think we've all addressed the, the student um, issues, of course, and that is paramount in all of our minds. But I also am very concerned about our teachers and our staff. They are, um, they want to get back to practice their craft and their trade. They're good at it. And they're best at teaching in person. Um, they love these kids. It's an emotional um, attachment for them as well. And so I do worry about our adult staff. Um, many of them are in the age range where they have also young children at home. And so if they are trying to teach everyone else's children online and deal with their own children, um, it's, it's not good for anyone. So I think I just want to kind of put that plug in for our teachers and staff. We, we can't forget about the adults that serve our children. Absolutely. Okay, and as you know, at a time when the chiefs across the entire nation have committed to serving every child, this equity component is so um, so important for all of us right now. For me, the concern is how we're seeing this building closure just magnifying the opportunity gap, the achievement gap, all of the experiences that our children desperately need. And we see that growing. So when you talk about the learning loss, um, I think it's real, we see it's magnified particularly concerned about our youngest learners knowing what we know about brain development. They can't, a five-year-old can't afford a gap year. So, I mean, you know, talking about a gap year, think of, I get your, get your point, we don't want to talk about it, but think about what that does for a five-year-old. So I think those are our biggest concerns is, is closing um, that, that real opportunity gap for our kids and um, making sure that our earliest learners are, are right there with, with our other college, uh, kids. 
Thank you. So with a large community college, we're still running. We kept running in the spring. We're running this summer all virtually. However, what's hurting is workforce. So we can't run our welding classes. We can't run the programs that require the hands-on learning right now. Actually, this week we started completion academies. So we have actually started back up to bring those hands-on learning with social distancing, very carefully with masks, but we're beginning to do that because our employers need it and we know we are what stands between our students uh, and having a prosperous future and meeting the needs of our employers in the community. So we're going either way, but we will miss many if we're not able to fully open. I was uh, speaking with a friend of mine who uh, is an administrator in a, a, another state, and uh, he committed to me that we have a plan. Um, I said, I don't want to rain on your parade, but if I were to give you any advice, it would be have more than one. <laughs> the, the problem with what we face today is the unknown. While we all want to get to the same place, we want to open, reopen America's schools, what we may have to overcome in order to do that, up to and including after the, the technical beginning of the school year starts, is yet unknown. And by virtue of that fact, uh, most of the people that I know out around the country in the field, and this is both um, uh, uh, K through 12 and higher education, are developing multiple plans. We all call them contingency plans, just in case plan A doesn't completely come off the way we'd hoped it would. How are we going to make certain that all students have access to a quality educational experience on the first day of school? All of them. And if it is not all together in one location, what are the alternatives that can be provided along the way to make sure that if a campus can't open, education still has to? And what plans are we putting in place to make that happen? And I'd like to throw that out to uh, any of our panelists. I won't, I won't hit all of you on this one, just those that might want to want to take a piece of that one. Um, can I pick on you for a minute? Uh, Absolutely. That's what lieutenant governors are for. Um, Higher education has been at distance learning a lot longer yes. than K-12. One of my most disappointing moments was to witness firsthand on a national scale the anemic pivot from traditional programming to the world of distance education. It was anemic in most places. It was non-existent in far too many. And by virtue of that fact, schools just began to shudder because they had no other alternative but to close down. If we don't learn from that and make certain that we consider technology our friend in what happens in how we reopen and how do we deal with children who can't come on the first day of the school, whose parents perhaps may not want them to come back immediately until they see how this is playing out, how are we going to guarantee we just don't mark them absent, but we provide them a high quality educational experience? So higher education has been at online learning for a long time, for decades. And at Ivy Tech, we're 100,000 students plus 60,000 dual credit, those high school students of yours that we do as well. Um, and it's just been growing exponentially because our students need it. If I'm a single mom, I can't come to campus all the time, right? So online learning was something we had to do. We weren't as good at it as we needed to be, so we've been reinventing it at Ivy Tech and have eliminated most of the gap between the face-to-face -face and online, which is one of the real challenges. But because we had the capacity, we were able to make that shift quickly. And we had already gone to a lot of hybrid, which would mean you come on campus once a week, but you do something else from home. So having both. Now what we're piloting in the fall, which if I can share, is very exciting. We call it Learn Anywhere, where every week the student decides if they're going to come on campus, if they're going to do it virtually, or if they're going to do it online asynchronously. Now that is really meeting our student where they are. 
We'll have about 400 sections of Learn Anywhere this fall. And I can just say, if my faculty are watching right now, thank you. Because you can imagine how difficult that is. But it's at every attempt to meet them where they are. But of course, we need the hands-on. We still need the lab experiences. Those are things that we hold with very high value and, and critical to the programs that we offer. Blended. Blended in many different ways, yes. Anybody else want to bite of that apple, Commissioner? I'll jump in on that one. You know, we learned a lot in, in K-12 education in the last few months. I'm sure you all would agree with that. And, and um, I would say that education will not look the same. I don't think it will all be online, but it will be very different, I think, in how we approach um, learning activities. So I would, I'm really proud. I'm just going to talk about our teachers for a moment. Our teachers have been phenomenal through all of this experience, but we have some of our you know, some teachers who did this very, very well, it was second nature to them, some really struggled with it. And so those who did it really well are, and in fact, it was really a group of our teachers of the year have come together and they're developing various lessons and really like, we're all learning in this together. That's what I think has been so powerful about this experience is the ability to all of us say, what do we, how do we work and how do we help one another? So I think it's that component. We've also done a learning loss um, um, acceleration team uh, task force. They've come together. We're going to meet kids right where they are when they come in our doors. And there are two components that people are really, really interested in gathering is one, where are they academically? We know we need to know that. And we know we need to, you know, if we expect every fourth grader to walk in at a fourth grade level, we're kidding ourselves. We, you know, some of them thrived. Some of them did not do as well. So where are they and what can we help them with? Um, but also the social emotional concept. So how do we really give our teachers the tools to, to sit down and, and really identify where kids are and help them through this process? Well said. Yeah, I would say, you know, we're certainly planning on our students coming back for face-to-face -face instruction on August 6th, and we want as many of them to return as possible. Uh, we are a school system that serves about 52,000 children. Uh, so we have heard from a number of families that are not quite ready to send their children back to school. We've had a virtual school for grades 6, 12 for a number of years, and that has served our students very well. We are in the process of developing a K-5 virtual experience right now. Uh, we will offer our families a choice when they come back on August 6. Again, we hope they will return face-to-face, -face, and if they do, we will have guidelines in place, many of which we've been talking about uh, all morning. But we wanted to make sure we gave our, our families a choice, and we also wanted to be very prepared in the event we have to pivot again. We learned a lot from that experience last spring when we were out, and as the commissioner said earlier, many of our teachers um, performed admirably, heroically, I would say. Some of our teachers struggled in that environment, and so we've put together a really good professional development program over the summer, so we are even more prepared next year in the event that we have to learn virtually for a period of time. And I think it's incumbent upon all of us. You know, the key is flexibility, adaptability, and be prepared to pivot. One of the things uh, in the last three years, in the 102 year history of the school, we've had fires, we've had smoke, we had power outages, we have a virus. We joke that we're waiting, waiting for locusts and the Petaluma River to turn to red, <laughs> the blood. But the health and safety, uh, we put together about two weeks ago, Dr. Adriana Rios is here with me, uh, Dr. Steve Talk. We really put together a group of faculty members. And as everyone said, some really, in, you know, we're, we're very enthusiastic about teaching online, the distance learning, blended learning. Some struggled with it, so we provided a tremendous amount of, uh, I call it customer service to our faculty, so in order to help our students. We're a small school, just over 200 students, but we also know this is a working document. It's ever-evolving, and we're looking uh, August 10th that we're in school with all the protocol, policy, and procedures in place. Then we have a hybrid method, which will come Monday, Tuesday, off Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then, God forbid, we have to go to full distance learning. So we know we have to, to adapt and, and overcome those challenges as quickly as possible. Stay positive. It's really important for our faculty and our administration to stay positive with our parents and with our kids. Um, we've also looked at what are they doing in Australia. There are schools that opened up and 60% returned three, four weeks later. The other 40% came. We looked at our sister school in Avignon, France who looked at the uh, policies and procedures they put in place, Vincent DePaul School. Uh, we're looking at you know, what they do in Korea with the, the plexiglass around the desks. Uh, we don't really want to go there, but <laughs> if we have to, 
But I think it's, it's really important that, you know, instead of reinventing the wheel, that there's a lot of very talented people in this room and, and throughout the United States, throughout the world, that we can look and emulate and, and see if we can do the same thing. The uh, secretary uh, and some of our folks have been hosting a round of webinars of late. I don't know if any of you have tuned in yet. Uh, we're about to do our fourth and have uh, several more through the course of the summer. They're really all dedicated to a central issue of technology and education, not just distance education, but technology in all of education. Um, uh, the saddest day of my career uh, ended in New Hampshire this year when I was visiting uh, some of schools in New Hampshire, visiting schools be, being the favorite part of my job. Why was it the saddest day? Because I was called back because of the pandemic and that was the last time I had the opportunity to actually visit a school campus this year. And I know how depressing it was for me. I can't imagine how depressing it was for the faculty, the principal, the students, the family members of those schools, watching their schools just almost inexplicably going dark without really any degree of warning, and then now trying to claw our way back uh, to normal best we can. Those webinars are meant to try to do a number of things, including share best practice, but importantly, we have panelists on those webinars who share one thing in common. They haven't met a problem they couldn't figure out how to solve yet on this thing. They refuse, and it's an amazing thing. They'll tell you, oh, we ran into this problem and that problem, but here's what we did to get around that problem. Here's how we dealt with that when we overcame that problem. These are people who don't know the meaning of the word quit, and that's schools at the end of the day all over America. People who want these young people to succeed and learn and are willing to do just about whatever it takes to make that happen. Um, I wanted to um, ask our, our school board president, many schools were forced into distance education um, and you can tell us about your district and whether or not uh, that was the case in the spring. Generally, what impact did that have on on the families, not just the student, but on the, on the families. A little insight, Nancy, on that one? Uh, well, we've, we've heard quite a bit from our families. Um, we have, as you know, a relatively small district, a very tight community, and uh, we, our whole state shut down, uh, and it kind of seemed overnight, sort of was. We, we sensed that it was coming, and we were able to do some preparation for that. Um, <clears throat> our families rose to the occasion. Um, we have great families. Um, but it was very difficult. We have a lot of dual career families. We have a lot of families with multiple children. Uh, we have extremely active families. So for them to go from, you know, full tilt, which maybe isn't always perfect, uh, to everything stopped, sports and uh, scouts and everything else that our children and families do and the parents are very engaged in these activities as well I really do think that there was almost like a cloud of depression over our whole community and I noticed in um, you know we have an area where we can be outside and walk a lot I noticed that people weren't really you know kind of not looking at each other when they passed each other which is not like our community I noticed the same thing in the grocery store, even in masks. People just, they just don't know how to handle not being normal. And I think we all wanted to be sure that this new normal wasn't permanent. We don't want this to be our new normal. We want this to be our temporary normal. And I kept reminding people as I was talking to them, you know, this is difficult. We have pivoted very quickly into our distance learning and did a, a very nice job with it. We can do better um, when, now that we have more time to plan. But we all have to keep the perspective for our own mental health. This is temporary. This will, it's long, but it will eventually end. And so we can't plan to change our lives forever. And so I think, um, I, I think what I saw was that kind of just kind of collective depression. Now that people can be out a bit, our pools are open, people are a little bit more engaged. Uh, we're seeing more optimism, and our parents are begging us to please get the kids back in school. Not that they don't want their kids at home, they love them, but um, they know what's best for their family and their children. 
the um, Congress and, and the President uh, created and ultimately the President signed into the law the, the CARES Act. Um, it provided an awful lot of things. But what it provided to us, through us, in the Department of Education was a substantial amount of money dedicated to trying to help people uh, prepare. Uh, $13 billion for K through 12, another roughly $13, $14 billion for higher education flowed through the Department of Education. We actually retrofitted essentially our entire Department of Education to uh, make certain we had the appropriate documentation, accountability, uh, invitations to participate, you name it, and it was a major process because it was unprecedented in so many ways. And yet, within uh, a record-breaking amount of time, we were able to get that uh, $30 billion out to America's schools so that they could quickly be able then to pivot and use it for what they needed to do in order to either remain open or open again. A big part of that, and I'm about to poll you on this, was the idea that you don't have to use it all for this, but if we've learned anything, we've learned that the technology that we lamented we didn't have enough of when this thing broke. Not all children, not all students had a device of their own to take back and forth at home. Some communities, although schools are in very good shape around the country in terms of wiring, some communities still aren't wired. So the, the youngster would go to the edge of the chain link fence and go dark because their home was not wired in their community. And uh, it was about teacher training and make, making sure that teachers had to be trained. And this isn't just the traditional teachers. This is all faculty, all staff, all administrators needed to be better trained on how to utilize the technology as we worked with America's parents to help them through this because uh, we were essentially had become a complete society of homeschoolers. And by virtue of that fact, we were now relying more than ever before on moms and dads and grandparents to try to help make certain that children were able to get whatever we were able to give them. So the question I would ask you all is, on the, on the issue of teacher training, we're in the dead of summer, which is uh, in some ways for all of us a good thing because we've got some time to be able to do some things. Hopefully we've got some money to do it with. Um, and I'll, I'll just call it for, for ease, teacher training, but you know what I mean, the whole community. Um, how's that going? And Jeff, you had mentioned yours, I think, but how's everybody else doing in the world of educator training? How's that on this score? Jeff? Well, you know, I, again, I'm really proud of our teachers. You know, we, we don't force them to come in the, su in the summer months to take advantage of professional development opportunities, but many of them have. Many of them realized last spring that you know, there were some gaps in their instruction that technology could help in, improve those gaps. It was really interesting, you know, some of the feedback I heard from teachers was, you know, it forced me out of my comfort zone last spring. I picked up some skills I would have never picked up otherwise. And when we get back to normal, I'm going to be an even better teacher now than I was before because I can take advantage of some of the resources that are out there that I really shied away from in the past. So I'm really proud of how our teachers have stepped up to the plate. You mentioned the CARES Act funding. I'd re be remiss if I didn't say this. I am so appreciative of our local, state, and federal government, all three, how they supported us throughout last spring. The fact that uh, testing was waived last spring was, was absolutely the right thing to do for our students. We were able to show our students grace. We were able to show our families grace. We were able to provide them a lot of love and support. And I would say the one good thing that has come out of this, I think our community has really come together. I think we're more connected now than we ever were before in terms of making sure children have the resources and support they need to be successful. And I'm really appreciative of that. Outstanding. Anyone else? Um, what I've noticed is, um, well, first of all, our teachers did not get a summer. Uh, they they have been working all summer long because they they have to learn new skills, 
And when we went to distance learning in the spring, they did what they had to do. And we are a fortunate district. We have a lot of resources. And they did have the resources they needed, but they didn't have the experience. So we've invested heavily over the summer in time and money in those teachers because we know that even if we're all back in school, we will have some families who can't bring their children back to school, whether it's because of, of the child um, has a health issue or a family issue. And that child deserves the same high quality education that every child that steps on our campus gets. And so we've invested heavily in that over the summer. And I've been very pleased to see how uh, everyone has embraced that. And I'm excited to see what comes out of it. Thank you. Pat? You know, <clears throat> I'm very proud of our teachers, really am, and, and their enthusiasm during the summertime of working and, you know, mediocrity and, and, and just being satisfied isn't good enough. And we know that not only with our, our faculty knows that, they're very uh, enthusiastic about learning and expanding how they get best teaching practices. We've also looked at what companies are doing as well. My two daughters work for a company called Untucket and how they transitioned during this whole time period. And I think it's really important to look at companies. I have Rafael Velez, who's our board uh, chair and a parent, and reaching out and how does his company work with this? Ongoing training and how can we make it so it's you're not sitting in front of a computer, because I think after sitting on a conference call for an hour, I think even as adults, most of us would get tired of it. So it's how do we break that up? and how do we maximize the time and maximize the resources that we have. Well said. Commissioner? Sure, I'll kind of feed off of both of your, your topics there. I, I have already talked about how proud I am of our teachers and I will continue to say that and the work that they're doing this summer. I think an area that uh, I've been really impressed with in the summer in particular has been the CTE teachers. You talked about workforce development and trying to make sure they were equipped. They were pretty much stuck when they were saying, how do I do a welding project? What? And so they've put their heads together to really think about how can I do some of these hands-on activities. And for example, you know, I participated as a judge in a, um, a virtual hackathon uh, with our you know, State Chamber of Commerce and others coming together to bring teachers together in various regions in the state uh, to really think about how do we tackle this topic. So uh, a lot of excitement out there, uh, a lot of people thinking about how do we do our business just a little bit differently, knowing what we know now. And I think we're gonna see um, some real good, really great progress um, going forward. I, I know our time's gonna be slipping away here in a few minutes, and so I'm gonna get this in now, just in case, because this to me is sort of the most important part of this particular gathering. Um, it's always a little risky giving people advice, and remembering this is live streamed, so essentially you're giving America advice. Um, tough on a good day. But I, I really would, um, and I'm, I'm also letting you think about this a little bit while I, while I tee up the question, which is probably already obvious. Uh, if you could give America um, some advice, and it's okay. You are practitioners. You implement. You're leaders. So your advice is important, no matter what people might think, especially you yourselves. It is important. Tell me what kind of advice you'd give America regarding the reopening of America's schools at all levels. Yes, let me speak from the higher ed perspective. It's important that we allow the students who need to be there to be there, but that doesn't mean that every administrator or a faculty member who's teaching solely online or even all of the advisors, if you will, need to be there. Our approach is going to be to keep our density down. And even as a big employer, we employ 7,000 people across the state of Indiana in our cities. If we don't need, if we can work virtually and can do that effectively, which we watched 7,000 of our colleagues do, we should continue to keep that in mind as we plan forward. So my advice is make sure that our students come first, that we allow the the square footage, if you will, for our students to be there with the faculty who need to serve them, but in those other ancillary services or people who are overhead, right? If we don't need to be physically present, 
give that facility, make sure that it's fully leaning towards the student in every case. Well said. Commissioner? Okay, I think, I think my advice would be recognizing that uh, we're all in this together, we truly are, it's all hands on deck, and never underestimate the importance of solid relationships. And I know you said you felt your community was never stronger. I feel like that in the education community right now in Missouri because uh, we all, I mean, the power of picking up the phone call and having these regional groups that would call in, the superintendents that I have 40 teachers on a call tomorrow, the governor walked in, the governor's office, we've been in constant con uh, contact about how do we solve this dilemma, working very closely with the Department of Health, working very closely with our pediatricians, just really trying to solve this together. But I will tell you the schools that seemed to struggle the most were the schools that didn't have that built-in relationship with their parents and their families in the start. And those who are doing really well are the ones that had those relationships very much intact so never underestimate the importance of building and keeping uh, strong relationships and again uh, Penny's in the audience here we we're talking about the importance of reaching out to your fellow colleagues across the nation we're all working to solve these issues so very important to build your networks and and stay connected through this time that trust is is yeah. pivotal um, it's amazing it exists in the medical community people trust their doctors people trust their nurses and they have shined in this environment and I think largely because people trust them. And I feel the same way about education. People trust their teachers, they trust their school administrators, they trust the people in leadership roles in education uh, because they are literally putting their children in our care every single day. And if that trust is forged in iron, uh, it, it can go a long, long way to, to creating something special for students. Madam President. So uh, a little bit of a dovetail. I would say if you are a school district, engage your constituents, engage everyone down to the children, the taxpayers who don't have children in the school, they have a say also. It is very important that everybody be a part of the solution. And I really believe that if they have input, even if it doesn't go their way, they do feel a part of the of the process and I think some of our best solutions come from comments from parents a comment from a bus driver a comment from a child it is very important to engage those and then secondly I would just say to really strategize and really be sure that you have you know I, I look at it as we are um, planning for the best hoping for the best uh, but knowing that the not so best is likely to happen and having those strategies and knowing what those what we call trip wires are what is what issue or situation will trip the the response of a change so that we can be fluid and not have to just shut everything down and every time that we need to make some kind of an adjustment so i would just really strategize and and talk to each other in your communities really have an open dialogue thank you nancy I'd have three. I think I'd, I'd look to my mom and her twin, who's 93, who lived through the Depression, multiple wars. Between the two of them raised 14 kids, and there's that perseverance, faith, and grit that they taught us as kids. And I think that's something that we need to teach our kids today in America. I really believe that. And I think parents need to be advocates to their school districts, to their principals. It doesn't matter if it's Catholic, private, or public that they want their children back in school. I can't stress that enough. And trust that all of us would not put your children in harm's way. That's something that, you know, I understand everyone is different, but it's so important that you do trust the school and the decisions being made in order to educate your children in a very safe, healthy, and loving environment. Well said. I would say challenges create opportunities. We have probably never been more challenged in the history of public education, but I think it's an opportunity for us to grow and improve. I would also add we are a people business, a relationship business. We need to focus on that first. And the best schools and the best school systems, in my experience, they are the ones where home, school, and community work together as partners. Well said. I uh, remember as a little boy, um, quite a little boy, standing in line with all of my peers at my elementary school, and we would queue up 
to the front of the line where there would be someone waiting with a white plastic spoon. And on the spoon was a sugar cube. And on the sugar cube, there was a pink to red liquid. And we would take it, it tasted very good, and we would move on. That was the polio vaccine. Another major health issue that afflicted enormous numbers of America's young people. But I also remember standing in that line, too young to really know about all of this, but knew I trusted the people who were around me. I trusted my teachers. I trusted the family members who came to help with the, dis you know, the dispensing of, of this vaccine. I trusted the people around me. They knew much more than I did, but I also knew they cared much more than anybody could imagine. And going into this next round of educational opportunity for young people in America, it is incumbent that once again we challenge ourselves to make sure we are worthy of that trust, that we do the right things for them and with them, not only to open schools and open them safely, but to make sure that what, what is on the other side of that is a world-class educational experience that will give them the same opportunities that I was given at that time, and that is simply to grow up and live my little share of the great American dream and know that education is pivotal in making sure that that's the case. I hope you will join me in thanking our wonderful panel members for being with us today. By the way, Governor, she's pretty good. Yeah, she does all right. I know you're here to make sure that's the case, but she does. She's okay. I want to thank the Secretary for uh, giving me the chance to be a small part of this today, but also to help put together uh, the events that we're all enjoying here today and will still continue uh, to, um, uh, to enjoy through the rest of the afternoon and find it useful, helpful, and hopeful in the work that we as Americans have to do ahead of us to make sure that we don't take a back seat to anybody in terms of reopening our schools and providing every one of those young people their shot at the great American dream. Thanks for being a part of this session.